Welcome, everybody. I have a very powerful man here to, to talk with us today. I'm very excited to be with him. And he has been a huge influence in my life and very other people's life. This will be on uh, Exploring the Ka on YouTube. And we basically will be talking about exploring the interstellar medium and various other things that Professor Chandra with Rama Singh has been working on most of his life. Uh, he's a Sri Lankan born British astronomer, astrobiologist. He's also known for working with the late Sir Fred Hoyle and working on the theory of cometary panspermia. He's also a pioneer of the new science of astrobiology and has been a poet, a prolific author, and has written many scientific papers and received so many awards throughout his life. Uh, he's a fellow of the College of Jesus College of Cambridge and professor at University College Cardiff and Cardiff University for many years. And he is uh, an honorary professor at Buckingham and a longtime crusader for the truth in science and astronomy. We welcome once again, Professor Chandra. It's glad to have you again, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, you know, before we, we get started even deeper, I, I want people to, uh, or if they're not familiar, some of my my listeners out there might not be too familiar, but you're you actually began working with Sir Fred Hoyle in your early life, and I know from reading some of your your books, you said that in 1961, you had a, a sort of a, a start of your intellectual journey. That's right. Yeah, that's you right. Know, uh, going uh, with uh, the origins of life, right? Uh, well, I, I didn't start immediately with the origins of life. I came from Sri Lanka, where, as you mentioned, I grew up and. That was my uh, country of birth. Uh, I had my first training in Sri Lanka in mathematics. I did my degree, undergraduate degrees in mathematics and so on, and was awarded a scholarship uh, by the British government to come to the UK and do a PhD. And I chose to come to Cambridge because that was my father's university in 1927. He was a mathematician himself. He, obtained the highest honors in mathematics from the Cambridge University of Cambridge. So I ended up in, at my father's old, old college, which was Trinity College, Cambridge. And I began my uh, research. And my research supervisor was the late Sir Fred Hall. So this was a, a great moment for me because I had already read about Fred Hall. I, read some, I had read some of his books, including a science fiction novel called The Black Cloud, uh, only maybe two years before I arrived in Cambridge. So this was a good start. And I um, then uh, went to his house. Uh, he, he saw all his students and collaborators, not in his lab or in his office, but in his, in his home. So I went there and um, formed really a good friendship with the whole family, with his wife and and himself and so on. And so we started on a project that was connected with the sun. And he said, this is a very interesting project. I, ha I have been in interested in that. Fred was interested in this for a long time. And the question is why and how does the sun's magnetic field reverse every 11 years? We know there's a solar cycle, sunspots come and go over, over a uh, 11 year solar cycle as it's called. And so I tried to work out a mechanism by which the sun's magnetic field sort of switches from north, south to south, north over a period of 11 years. Well, that was a fairly sort of rigorous mathematical exercise. And at the end of doing that, after one year of researching on that, I was a bit fed up with the, with the process of doing sort of little calculations um, and little calculations means calculations that didn't amount to big things, which was like the sun's polar magnetic field. So uh, we published a paper on that, um, on, the, on the research I did. And then I went to see Fred Hall and said, I, how about a project to do with the black cloud? And he, he thought that was very funny because he wrote that as a, as a story, not as a science. And he, then he began to think about it and said, yeah, you may be right. There are problems that are still unsolved. For example, what is the cosmic dust made of? There is a orthodox point of view around in 1960 
that this all this dust that you see in between the stars in the Milky Way is made of uh, tiny ice particles, microscopic ice particles, and um, uh, it, this needs to be looked into more carefully. Okay, so that's then I went back uh, to my college and to, back to my rooms and so on and began to think about how the whole pro process of forming tiny crystals of dust or ice, ice crystals as they used to be thought. And I came to the conclusion that this, the, the standard story had nothing to go for in terms of its merit. The so, ice grains, right? Like grain, ice, the ice grains, yeah. Yeah, was just uh, total nonsense. Uh, and it was a nonsense that was developed by a group of very powerful Dutch astronomers. And they were very powerful astronomers you know, on the world scene. And because they published several papers on ice particles and so on in interstellar space, the, the, this became the, the orthodox position, right? And uh, so I looked into the whole question right from the beginning, from first principles, and I came to the conclusion that there's nothing going for this ice grain theory. And the, the dust in space had to be mainly composed of the element carbon. Right, and that was a big, big step uh, towards uh, what transpired sort of 20 years later, because carbon, of course, is the main component of, of life, right? Um, but uh, to begin with, we thought of carbon like soot particles formed in stars and sort of thrown out into space and so on, and filling the, um, the recesses between the stars in the Milky Way and so we, we played with that idea for about three years. And during that time, there were new techniques in astronomy that were coming to the fore, like um, observations of stars from above the atmosphere. Because until that time, until the 1960s, all of the astronomical observations were made um, from the ground, from using ground-based telescopes. So you had the clouds to contend with, the clouds in the sky. And so as soon as there were possibilities of having telescopes that were launched above the Earth's atmosphere, right, and uh, stars examined from above the, the, the absorbing layer of the, the, the water layer in the atmosphere, then uh, a new universe began to be ex ex exposed to astronomers. And part of this new universe was a study of the dust in space, in deep space. And the dust in deep space turned out exactly as I had predicted uh, two years earlier. It was not made of ice. It was definitely not made of ice. So I kept on going to meetings, conferences, and uh, making this statement and making a lot of people angry. I made many enemies in the process because these guys are very powerful establishment figures who were maintaining a wrong theory for maybe 20 years or so. But eventually, I think the facts, all as always, in the long term, facts have to prevail. And um, by the early 1970s, this is now 10 years on, astronomers began to say that maybe Chandra and Fred are right. This is all uh, mainly made, the dust in space is mainly made of the element carbon. Now, so things went on like that, and new techniques, as I said, not only just from above the clouds, but new uh, spectroscopic techniques. Open, there was new wavelengths that were open for investigation in the infrared, in the microwave, in the radio wavelengths, and so on. And particularly the infrared began to show up some very, very important uh, uh, results in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. And in the early 1970s, by 1973, I came to the conclusion that the dust in space was just not carbon in as soot, but carbon in the form of very complex organic molecules. Organic polymers is what we uh, decided they were at that time. And we published loads of papers in columns of Nature, the most prominent journal at the time. And they published these. And they were, of course, some of 
sometimes they were refuted by guys like Carl Sagan, who said that, no, this is very interesting, these ideas of Chandra and Fred's, but organic molecules cannot survive in space. So this cannot be the, the answer. And so on. So all of that sort of political wrangling went on. But um, this was about the time that you guys put out Life Cloud? Yeah, we put out Life Cloud, Cloud yeah. Yeah, Life Cloud was 1979. And by that time, 1977, by that time we had. Uh, that's, an, that's an interesting time for you, Professor Chandra, also as well. I think you had a significant change, which is interesting because I was born around that time, 77, 78. Um, yeah. You said that was one of the sickest you've ever been in your life. I, 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 I with the <laughs> right, and, and and during that fever, you sort of called Fred Hoyle and came to a <laughs> Sir Fred Hoyle and and came to a a mad fever revelation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I really, he's written about this in his in his uh, uh, articles that are in the archives of St John's College, Cambridge. Now that this wow. telephone telephone call from Chandra seemed, seemed to change his life. So I made this call and said, uh, I, I don't feel really very um, smart today to talk to you because I've got a bit of a fever and a cold and I think I've got the flu. And then I just made a stray comment that in the place that I came from, which was Ceylon, Sri Lanka, uh, in the Indian subcontinent, uh, people had the long-standing belief that uh, flu and cold and infectious diseases came from the skies. From yeah, the I mean, even even my grandmother used to say to me, get out of the rain before you get sick. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. yeah that, that was deeply rooted in, in ancient cultures, not just in India, but in China, in, as you said, in your part of the world and so on. So this was, uh, th this was the reason that I made this comment. In, in Europe, however, however, this was not the case. Everything was... Uh, supposed to be man-made or 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 something like that and it's not uh, it was not connected with the with the universe no condition or no human condition was admitted by the western cultures to be connected with with the um, with the external universe so that was something that came from my own individual cultural background um and so he, uh, Fred Hall, was sort of amused by this. And he said, he, but he made him stop and think. He said, let me think about it and telephone you back. So at the end of the day, he phones him back and he said, yes, Chandra, I think you are almost certainly right. What I did in the last three or four hours is to look at, um, uh, at Shakespeare and ask the question, was there any character in Shakespeare, in the whole corpus of the Shakespearean plays, where there was a guy who was sniffling, cold, right? Because Shakespeare dealt with almost every human condition, every single human condition you can think of Shakespeare did. So if the common cold was the, was in, in Europe, in England at the time, he certainly would have made some fun of it, at least. And the fact that... Um, <laughs> so this is a strange kind of... Because wow, that's due to scientific conclusion, he came to. So he says, Chandra, you may be right because this is. And then I, he says, we look at the, uh, the history of illnesses has been recorded in various places throughout the uh, last uh, thousand years or so. It's been a changing pattern of, of diseases, right? Diseases have not always been the same for thousands of years. And so this is the this was a start for the second project, which was the book that we wrote, Diseases from Space. Okay, and then we went into sort of deeper into that and so on. But um, but I think more interesting interesting from the scientific point of view is that we were getting more and more data that was supporting the idea that there was a huge amount of living material in the form of microscopic living particles, right? Bacteria, maybe viruses, throughout the interstellar medium. Now, I should tell you that the interstellar medium is the, uh, is the space between the stars. If you look at the Milky Way on a, on a dark night, cloudless night, you see the stars sort of arching across the heavens. That's the Milky Way. In between the stars, you also see patches 
in different shapes, right? Striations, horses' heads, like something they called the horses, horse heads nebula, the eagle nebula, and so on. These are just patterns that are random patterns that look like uh, different things. And those dark clouds are made of trillions upon trillions of inter interstellar dust particles that essentially block out the light from distant stars. Okay. Now, the question then is, why is it not possible to unravel the makeup, chemical makeup of these dust particles by looking at the light that is emitted from stars behind the clouds? Okay. If there's a star behind one of these clouds, the cloud has, has to be fairly light. It, if it's very, very thick, then you won't see any light. So some of the at, the, at the edges of the clouds, of these dark clouds, you might see a star that is partially obscured by the dust, but yet is shows up on our telescopes. So the question that we raised, and that I raised, was that, is it possible to examine the spectrum of a star that is behind one of these cosmic dust clouds, interstellar dust clouds. And that was a project that occupied us for about two or three years, and we did many, many different astronomical calculations, observations, and so on. And we came to the conclusion that these are very complex organic molecules that are involved in the dust. Not not very simple molecules, not like carbon dioxide or methane, something, but very very complex, long chains of molecules. Right? And so, in 1974, I published a paper in Nature called "Organic Polymers as Interstellar Grains." It was published. It was, we, we thought at the time that they were like formaldehyde polymers, right? right? And um, this created a huge rumpus amongst astronomers. They said that no, this cannot be. There must be some other explanation for what Chandra and Fred are looking at. But there was no explanation that it was valid at the time. So we 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 stuck with this and we went further, made further observations of uh, of uh, astronomical sources, and we came to the conclusion that this has to be really complex organics. And then this is another very crucial step in the whole process. Then we said that how can so much organic materials of such complex structures exist in the spaces between stars? Because we reckoned that something like one-tenth of the mass of the carbon in the universe, or certainly in our galaxy, was tied up in the form of stuff that is uh, organic, and could possibly be connected with life, right? If, if, if we had found that amount of organic material in our backyard, in our back gardens, we do not now hesitate to say that these were derived from life, isn't it? Life processes produce organics. Organics break up, break down into smaller units. And these, this is what you're seeing in the sky, in deep space. But uh, we are not allowed to say that in the uh, in the culture, scientific culture that existed in 1980, uh, 1980s. But then a very, very interesting personal story has to be told because my brother, my younger brother, is was at the time a, a professor at the University of... Uh, it's called the Australian National University in Canberra, Australia, and he was an astronomer also, right? He, had, he trained in astronomy. And he had access to the world's biggest telescope at the time. In the 1980s, the Anglo-Australian telescope was the most powerful telescope around. And so Fred and I were visiting over in Cardiff on one fateful day in 1981. And then Dal also came, my brother came. And the three of us began to talk about astronomy. And how could we, three astronomers, nail down this hypothesis or this idea of the dust being connected with life? So the, my brother said, let's look at the most distant star that is blocked by interstellar dust. 
distant star in our Milky Way system and look at it through spectr using spectrometers, spec how, see how light is absorbed at different wavelengths. And we can make a prediction as to what would be the outcome if the stuff between us and the distant star is essentially freeze-dried bacteria or desiccated bacteria or degraded bacteria. We can make a prediction as to what uh, the astronomers would see. And we made that prediction. And about three months later, uh, these guys go to the Australian National Telescope and make an observation of the most distant uh, stellar object and find exactly, point by point, the pattern that we predicted, right? Amazing. And at that point, I think from working sort of 100% on this project, we, that is myself and Fred Hall, had no doubt whatsoever that our hypothesis was unique and had to be the only hypothesis, uh, only theory that supported the data. So we published papers and so on, on in various scientific journals. We were attacked by a whole lot of people, right? Uh, the establishment came really. And this is the point at which a huge battle started between us who were saying that there's life everywhere, that this is panspermia, uh, the ancient ideas of of um, an exergus in Greek, in Greece, plus pre-Socratic Greece, and much older ideas also uh, going back to Vedic times in, in North India. They all had this idea that life is eternal and life is uh, part of the cosmos. Uh, so this was, uh, uh, this was what we had in the 1980s. And through the 1980s, through the 1990s, we were getting more and more information on both on astronomy that supported this uh, thesis and also from biology itself. The old idea, the original ideas of panspermia that go back to ancient Greece were refuted vigorously and violently by astronomers and scientists in the early part of the 20th century because, largely because they were at variance with the Judeo-Christian worldview, I think. That's, that's my point of view, right? And they had made many, many statements like bacteria would not survive the conditions in space. You throw a bacteria into space and it will be nothing. They'll be, they'll be just dead, dead forever and so on. But that's in the, in the mid-1980s. But now, 10 years, 20 years on, we know for absolute certainty that bacteria can survive the harshest conditions. There are bacteria in radioactive dumps on the earth. There are bacteria in the deep oceans. There are bacteria in uh, uh, wherever you look at. You put bacteria on the outside of the International Space Station, it survives. You plaster bacteria on, on a rocket and fly it through the atmosphere, and that survives. So uh, bacteria are great survivors, there's no question about it. Survivors much more than would be necessary if life is a purely plan planetary or a purely terrestrial phenomenon. So everything is pointing and pointed in the 1990s to life being a cosmic phenomenon. And day by day, to, to this very day, that, that data is, is accumulating but it's being sort of essentially smothered by uh, political innuendos. For example, at the current moment in time, there's a huge hype over two bits of carbonaceous rock that have been picked up in the in the um, interplanetary medium. And these rocks are, one, one is Bennu, one is Rigu, and there have been samples have been brought and they have found Lo and behold, that there are organic molecules that could be related to life right, within these uh, structures. And let's make a big thing of it. This is a lot of carbon there, a lot of um, exposure to water has been confirmed, and, um, and, and a small bunch of organic molecules that could be related to life. And a big deal is made of it because they, these are picked up by Americans and Europeans and they're finding these things. So they, the story now is that um, these objects, the asteroids and comets, I should say also, comets are the 
the parent bodies, I think, I think, are the parent bodies of these so-called asteroids, a Rigu Bennu kind of uh, system. And um, uh, they, they, they carry the uh, they carry signatures of life. They're not just uh, the components of life, but they are signs that there was life inside a comet at one point in, in, in its history, and the comet now has been sort of degraded and evaporated. Most of the stuff, most of the volatiles have gone out, and you le you're left with little lumps that they're bringing back, and, and they're making a big thing out of a few organic molecules. Do but organic molecules... I'm sorry. Do you think, Professor Chandra, certain planets like Venus could even be a leftover comet that ended up? Not Venus, particularly. Venus might have components that went into it in its latter stage of formation that were comets, and and certainly those could have contributed to life uh, biology in the atmosphere of Venus, because we know that there is there is some signs of. Uh, of uh, living processes in Venus, like phosph phosphine was detected about five, four or five years ago in the in the atmosphere. I think even and ammonia. Even ammonia, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah and and uh, this is an interesting, almost sort of up to the moment discovery and discussion. About three, four weeks ago, astronomers using the James Webb Telescope uh, discovered an exoplanetary system, that means a planetary system outside of our solar system, located some 220 light years away. And on one of those planets, they discovered a molecule called dimethyl, uh, 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 an organic molecule that is only produced by living organisms. I think it's dimethyl sulfide was the molecule that they, that they reported, together wow. with methane and carbon dioxide. And so the combination of these three molecules, they have reckoned, sorry, the astronomers have reckoned and, and written about, this means that there is life on that planet, or high probability of well, microbial life on the planet. And then the next statement, of course, is that this means this is the, the establishment saying, this means that spontaneous generation of life could happen very easily, happens readily. Total nonsense. Spontaneous generation of life, we have argued, is, is a one-off miracle that happened maybe once in the entire history of the universe. And then after that, uh, it is a panspermia. It is just horizontal gene transfer across vast tracts of the cosmos. And that's, so that's what's happening. I mean, they're finding all these things. And they're finding also recently the James Webb Telescope. Uh, like a bacterial phage, right? How, with the horizontal gene transfer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Horizontal wow. gene is, there, there's no question that horizontal gene transfers must take place because our solar system, for instance, this is our planetary system, including our inhabited Earth, Earth that is full of life, does a circuit, this whole solar system, does a circuit around the center of the galaxy with a period of 240 million years. So once in 240 million, this is circuit. And in that orbit of the solar system, uh, it encounters, comes very close to many other planetary systems. Okay. And these planetary systems are, could be full of life. Oh, I think they have to be full of life. And they could be connected. I mean, physically, stuff that is thrown out from the from the Earth would reach these other planetary systems, and vice versa. So the whole whole of our solar system is connected inextricably with a much bigger system of planets, of exoplanets, of planets. Do, do, do you see all this connected? Because now nowadays, I, I I've been getting really into the plasma side of things do you, so even the interstellar medium do you think everything is interconnected by plasma oh like yeah the lifeblood and 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 do you see uh, the sun of our solar system as not a hydrogen sphere but a plasma sphere yeah well i think so, certainly the uh, the inter the interior of the sun is a nuclear furnace there's no question about it right it is at a temperature and a density that is so high that it's converting hydrogen to helium Four hydrogen atoms, uh, nuclear become a helium nucleus, 
and that's the source of the energy that we receive from the sun, hydrogen to helium conversion. Um, but further out in the exterior of the sun, in the, in the chromosphere, photosphere, and so on, you have high temperatures, thousands of degrees, and a plasma, ionized gas, and um, magnetic fields that behave in very, very strange ways. Yeah. There are loops of fields, magnetic fields that are being pushed out from the sun. The sun is very turbulent in the outer in its outer layers. So it's just spewing out this stuff, and some of it is reach, reaches the earth. This is a solar particle, solar wind that reaches all the planets, reaches us, and and that's what essentially causes the the uh, northern lights and so on, isn't it? This, this is yeah. A the, it, so is the is the sun? I mean, this might be controversial in astronomy, but is it basically energized at its surface and externally powered by in, in, inflowing plasma from other places? No, it's it's powered by from within, I think. Entirely. Powered from within? From within, because the, the, the huge energy source is the energy source that results from the conversion of helium, uh, or hydrogen to helium, and that's that's still powering the sun. It's 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 a nuclear reaction essentially that gives all of its energy, most of its energy, right? It gets degraded into different forms. It uh, eventually degrades into a six six thousand degree temperature, and then yeah, that's what. That's... Yeah, it's it's very it's very interesting that so so it it, it would be still energy. So, because because I've I've read that some some plasma physicists think that it's literally energized at its surface and externally powered from inflowing plasma, you know. And... Well, not from in, I I, think, I, mean, I I would disagree with that. I think the main energy source surely is the energy source that that drives the sun to uh, radiate the uh, uh, to, to become a yeah. star, so, and that radiation is essentially from hydrogen to helium conversion taking place continuously. At the center of the star, but I mean, then then the plasma comes in because the 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 the, the gas overlying gases are ionized, and so ionized gas is a plasma. So there's a lot of plasma physics taking place in the exterior, and magnetodyna hydrodynamics taking place in the exterior because we have these swirling clouds of uh, of plasma with magnetic fields wrapped in them, and so on. And the magnetic fields and the plasma are sort of strewn out in space, right? There are loops of magnetic fields that are thrown out. But the magnetic fields are driven by currents that are essentially powered, ultimately powered by the hydrogen to helium conversion. And and these these currents basically have like spiraling electrons, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, they, yeah. An electron around the magnetic field is has a spiral orbit, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, so the solar wind, its force is what shapes magnetospheres. Yeah, yeah, essentially, yeah. And and so uh, the magnetosphere I, is, is very interesting in itself as well. Um, I, and I've been finding connections even to, and it was I think some of the information uh, was published in Nature as well about the the sounds when electrons get caught in the magnetosphere. Mm -hmm. You know, and the and and I found it very interesting that birds tend to mimic these sounds or sound very similar mm. to these sounds, and and they and birds start doing it an hour before dawn, mm. and uh, a lot of and Professor Chandra, I found a lot of uh, interesting tales in in uh, uh, mythology, like yeah. um, it, there, there's this one scholar Arthur Bernard Cook who who many many years ago in the early 1900s wrote uh, uh, volumes on Zeus. And mm. one of these one of these stories is about uh, Nephalacagia, that these cosmic birds build a cage around Earth to keep out famine and disease. And the very bir birds that make this are the woodpecker, the hoopoe, and the cuckoo. Now mm. they make very similar sounds to the electrons mm. in the magnetosphere. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's an interesting comment because the magnetosphere of, of the Earth is is a protective shield against. Uh, charged electrically charged bacteria and viruses that are coming in if, if... the life life couldn't sustain without a magnetosphere basically no. right yeah yeah like mars doesn't have one well mars uh, it's questionable about the uh, strength of the magnetic field is of mars but it doesn't have as big a magnetic field as yeah. the earth 
and Jupiter has a mag, ma a huge right, like like the magnetic yeah. the magnetic moment of Jupiter is yeah yeah yeah. I but, had a book, I had a book called the Magnetis the Jovian Magnetosphere, uh, from the set, late seventies or eighties that I, I I have that that I found that amazing. Yeah. But I think the, 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 the life connection with the solar system is really coming to absolute fruition in the last 20, 20 or 30 years. From the time the Halley's Comet was first uh, observed, the last last perihelion of Halley's Comet was 1986, and um, every astronomer believed that they would see a, a dirty ice ball Right, uh, it, that was a model of the comets that was sort of sanctioned by American authorities and European authorities also. So they had uh, a spacecraft, uh, Giotto, a European spacecraft that was designed to go and rendezvous with the comet, a very close flyby with the com with this comet, and take pictures. And they expected a, a bright snow field. So in the old-fashioned cameras, what do you do? You turn the aperture, right, the, 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 to, to almost nothing, right? If you're going to photograph a snowfield, you turn your ap aperture to f, f over 16 or something, or the smallest aperture. So that's what they did. And then the spacecraft went by on schedule exactly at the right time, and uh, they couldn't find anything. They were not picking up any signal at all. So I remember television reporting and so on. At that time, we watched glue to the television set and said, oh, we missed the comet. We are, we are surely good. Something's gone wrong. We haven't found this comet. And what they did was essentially they, they blocked out the comet because they had closed the apertures. And uh, they had to do a lot of image processing before they turned up with the, the comet that was darker than the, what they call the darkest coal. So the comet, Halley's comet was darker than the darkest coal. And um, the particles that came out from it also matched precisely the infrared properties of a bacterium. And here, again, my bro brother in Australia, it lo almost looks like a family conspiracy. My brother in Australia, Dahl, and his collaborators published a paper in, in Nature saying that it's strange, it's surprising that the, that the spectrum, infrared spectrum of this comet matches exactly the spectrum of bacteria, <laughs> right? Of course, since then, people say, this is just a coincidence. There are a few organic molecules that have got together and, and just mimics the properties of a bacteria. So that's that's why they keep going. Uh, that's the, they keep going on and on and on. And the latest space exploration of a comet was, of course, the 2013 Rosetta mission to a comet called 67P, C stroke G, and and we got we were sort of involved in that. We modeled it in some this comet from all the data that came. We also had some my colleagues and I had some input, or we thought we had some input into the planning of the uh, of the Rosetta mission. Uh, we had my colleague had proposed an experiment that was costing fourteen thousand dollars to put an instrument on the comet to detect life, microbial life, right? Uh, very cheap experiment by any standards, but it was refused. So no life detection experiment went there. In the event, what they found on the comet was full of organic molecules that could be related to life or could be related to, uh, to pre-life, to prebiotic life. So that's what they're, that's what they're clutching to. That these are just prebiotic molecules that were amongst the stuff that were delivered to Earth at the time that life became established on the Earth. But nobody has addressed the question, how probable is it, given all the amino acids and all the nucleotides, and dump it on the Earth, how probable is it that life will emerge? And, and the answer is zero, but they don't admit it. It, yeah, it's, it's 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 amazing how science has become dogmatic in many ways. Mm. You, you know, people get stuck in certain views and it's accepted and yeah. it's horrible. Yeah, it's really you know, I, I, I found interesting, too, that you guys, I in my opinion now, my opinion, I know, doesn't hold weight in science. But 
I, I think you guys inadvertently predicted the origins of the coronavirus. Now, well, I think so. I've stopped. Talking. This is another thing. Just before I continue on that, this is a book that to which I uh, contributed uh, just out last week called "The Death of Science." Right. Wow. So, so you already get a title. And uh, anyway, so I, I think science is in a very bad way at the moment because yeah, for sure. Well, you, well, you, you, I don't know which book that. You, that if you wrote it by yourself or it was co-authored with Sir Fred Hoyle, but you discussed how how the Himalayas um, punch a hole in the stratosphere, yeah. right? Yeah. And and yeah. in in 2019, we went into the minimum sunspot cycle in December when coronavirus first came, yeah. and that would have punched a hole right above the Himalayas where there's breakthroughs in the stratosphere. To yeah. bring in everything that would go to Hong Kong and in those areas. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly the way I think that that that, that well, the events that happened prior to the the COVID outbreak. But the COVID story is so toxic that I've stopped talking about it. But yeah. in general terms, any virus that comes into the stratosphere is essentially pulled into the Chinese uh, mainland because of the Himalayas. Himalayas punches a big hole in the in the stratosphere and the air currents. Take take it first to the the vast plains of uh, of China. So I mean that's that's the reason why you have all these things first happening in China. Not that China produces them or manufactures them and person per, passes it person to person. I mean and once again the the virus. I've lost your voice. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it says it right in the Hindu and, and the Vedas, how, how Shiva sits at the top of the Himalayas doing his cosmic yeah. dance yeah, right? yeah, of, yeah. of death and rebirth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's all there in very ancient traditions. And uh, in the European tradition, the, the person who really was the pioneer of panspermia and the idea that life is a, a truly cosmic phenomenon is a man called Anaxurgus, right, who was a uh, hundred years before Socrates, he was pre a pre Socratic philosopher, very unorthodox. He also maintained an This guy an maintained the sun and the moon, and the sun and the moon were sort of physical objects, and they were not gods and goddesses, uh, as the Egypt as the Athenians believed. And he was essentially um, thrown out of Athens for his what is called his heresy. So the Europeans had, or the, or the classical Europeans, had a big problem with Anaxarchus. And 200 years later, after Anaxarchus, a guy called Aristotle turns up. Aristotle is a very, very, becomes a very prominent philosopher. He is the tutor to Alexander the Great. So that's a big plus for him, a good, strong recommendation. Uh, and his stuff <laughs> is earth-centered. The solar system is uh, centered on the Earth. The universe is centered on, on the Earth. And life emerged on the Earth by spontaneous generation. And, and that <laughs> was the European position in science until 2024. We still believe that this is the case. And it's just amazing. I think it's just amazing. I think at some point, the truth has to prevail. And the truth is exactly the way that Fred and I have discussed it in uh, various uh, papers and books and so on. But very slowly, these things are taking, uh, they have some traction. Now, in April, on April the 5th, there's a meeting of the International Astronomical Union and the Royal Astronomical Society in England. And um, the title of the meeting is... Uh, implications for discovering the existence of alien life right and this was announced and i thought they're going to exclude any reference to me and fred but lo and behold the organizer writes to me about a week ago to say could i as a pioneer of this subject give the keynote lecture public lecture so something is happening wow. somewhere congratulations yeah. I mean, I don't know. They might still re re reverse their decision. But <laughs> anyway, that, I think I think it's very hard to to uh, 
escape the truth, isn't it? The truth is such a powerful um, thing. I mean, that we're, it, we're starting to get extraordinary evidence now because extraordinary claims need the extraordinary evidence. Now we're getting it in bucket loads with James Webb and various... And, and, and okay. that, that's a funny statement also because the extraordinary claim that people are talking about is that life is confined to the earth. Isn't that an extraordinary claim? It's in the knowledge... That, yeah. That would be more extraordinary than it not being out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. so. I, I think it's all perverted to such an extent that I, I feel I feel a bit sorry for our descendants that we are, we, we are landed with such hypocrisy. I do as well. Yeah, it's so true. Is, is there anything else that you have coming up, Professor Chandra, that you'd like to promote? No, no, except that the other thing that I really wrote about was the, uh, recently, was the discovery of uh, evidence against the Big Bang cosmology, yeah. Big Bang universe, because according to orthodoxy, the universe is supposed to have begun ex nihilo from nothing, 30, exactly 13.8 billion years ago. 13.8 billion years ago. And when you think about 13.8 billion years ago, it's just a little over three times the age of the Earth, right? We know the Earth is at least 4.5 billion years ago. So it's a relatively short time scale. And the way they discovered that, the way they inferred this 13.8, is to study the way that galaxies appear to be receding from us, right? And, they, then, and that data was very secure from astronomy from redshifts of galaxies and so on. So that's not, the, that's not the problem. But the problem is, how do you interpret that as a, a single event? If you turn all the velocities backwards, it goes to 13.8. Is that a real, is that a, a real reversal and a true origin? That's a big question. Mark. And Fred and, and his colleagues for many, many years, but from the 1950s, on through all, the entire span of 30 or 40 years, maintain that this is not the way to understand that data, that the universe has an, it could have an eternal existence. Right? So we th thought of a steady state universe, universe that was up and down, undulating. And these are all models that were, are not new in terms of uh, our ancient Indian cosmology. It goes back to the Vedas, as you said, and and uh, what's recent in terms of discoveries is, the, again, the James Webb telescope is a fantastic telescope, beautiful detailed images of, ga of our galaxy, of external galaxies and so on. And they have now found a galaxy at 33.5 billion light years ago. I remember the universe is supposed to be 13.8 billion is uh, um, years old, so this is a big, big problem. And I think there are many people like Sir Roger Penrose, who's uh, in Oxford, he's in his 90s, quite a senior scientist, and he's maintained that this really shows that, uh, universe, that the Big Bang universe is, is all flawed, it's, it's not the right answer. So it's all happening. I think uh, it's paradigm shift upon paradigm shift, upon paradigm shift and um, and what is left of the old science is left to be seen i think he, yeah you're right and i think we're there's always going to be a war amongst powerful information that has to do with the secrets of nature and universe the the vedas discuss um, a vedic war between the asura and the deva clans that's right yeah, yeah right and and literally what they fight over is called the spotted sacred cows, which represent the rays of the sun. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're literally fighting over the knowledge and information that they're harnessing and receiving yeah. from the sun. Yeah, yeah. I think it's an eternal struggle. It's part of, um, maybe part of human, the human condition that we are destined to be in conflict about the nature of our existence. I really think so. I think this is an inescapable fact. It's incredible. It's incredible. And, and maybe what what we what the what we carry with us and what we learn on this on this Earth planet 
maybe the pop that gets embedded in our particles and we carry that into space and it goes into the eternal and it's reborn in another in another re universe in another time. Yeah, because people have held these views with great conviction right through history and amongst the people who really are to be uh, lauded and, and praised and given every possible accolade post, uh, post-mortem includes uh, Giordano Bruno, who maintained, he's a poet, he's a philosopher, he maintained that uh, uh, there are other planetary systems oc- occupied by other beings and so on, and and this was against Aristotelian philosophy. At the time, Aristotle was was like God for for the Roman Catholic Church. He was second to God, and uh, if anyone challenged Aristotle, then you're in trouble. So yeah. Galileo tra- challenged Aristotle. He was he was put under house arrest. He was not killed though. Giordano, Giordano Bruno tra- challenged him, and he was put to death. So this is uh, the fate of uh, or people who challenge the orthodoxy. I think the orthodoxies that are being challenged are also, interestingly, religious orthodoxies. They are orthodoxies that are sanctioned by great religious bodies. And those religious bodies have had many things that are good about them, because every religion, like including Christianity, Buddhism, and you name it, every religion, Islam, and so on, have sought to extend the bounds of human sympathy, right? We have not abided by that in the most obvious ways. We can see it happening now in the Middle East, right? It's it's totally thrown out of the window. Uh, and what we retain of those ancient philosophies is just the wrong theories, the wrong beliefs, totally falsified by data and yet sanctified by tradition. And that, I think, is something that we we have to fight. I agree. I couldn't agree with you, Noah. That was beautifully put as well. And beautifully put. Everybody, this is the one and only world-renowned Professor Chandra Wickraman Singh. I will leave his links up for you guys to check out. It was a pleasure to have you with us today, Professor Chandra. And maybe in the future, we can have you on again and we could talk about some new discoveries and that, that are made and some new research that we'll always be doing. It was surely a pleasure. And you're one of my most favorite people to talk to in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raphael. That's very nice to talk to you. Take care. Have a good one. Thank I you. Appreciate it. I will send you the copy of this. Everybody, oh, Professor okay, Chandra, you. with Raman Singh. Take thank care. You.